Lindsay Pollock is an Australian musician who is known worldwide as a passionate and creative advocate for community music. His life has been full of unusual opportunities to explore different styles of music, and his inventiveness has spurred him to create countless instruments from found objects. In this episode, you'll get to hear him play four different instruments in different improvisatory styles, and I'm sure that everyone will be inspired by stories from his life, describing some of his incredibly unusual, fun, and beautiful collaborations and creations. Please follow this podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. The video link is in the description along with detailed timestamps. Good day, Lindsay Pollock. Good day. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining me. Uh, my pleasure. So you are holding a Macedonian Gaida. That's correct. Yep, yeah, there it is. It's actually made in Australia with Australian timber and an Australian goat skin, but uh, but I've I've uh, modelled it on um, a, a particular Macedonian bagpipe that I had access to many 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 decades ago. Fantastic. Thank you so much. My pleasure. So how is that bagpipe different than like a Scottish bagpipe? And maybe there's different types. I don't know, know about bagpipes. There are many different bagpipes. Um, there are, well, definitely over, 100, uh, over 235 different types of bagpipes. Uh, wow. So okay. There's... there's one particular book about bagpipes that sort of lists or or, or quotes um, 235 different types. Uh, since that book was printed, there have been uh, a few different ones invented, including by myself. Um, so how, how it uh, differs for, from the Scottish pipes. Um, so we have one chanter. Uh, the difference uh, with this chanter, apart from the look of it, is that it's got a single reed. So it's a, a very primitive single reed, mm -hmm. so in, in a clarinet type instrument rather than the double reed of the Scottish pipes. It has one drone rather than three drones. Um, but apart from that, it's a, it's the same sort of animal. It's, it's using a, a complete um, goat skin in this case. They sometimes use sheep, but more often goat skins. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so that's the main difference. So I have to say, learning about you, you're so adventurous and very generous. And we're going to talk a lot about community music making today. And also mm -hmm. such an expressive player. I, I've listened so much to your recordings and just, yeah, fantastic musician. Mm, thank you. And y your story of uh, getting to know Macedonian music so deeply, we'll get into in a moment. But when you first got really interested in listening to the guide, I understand you were on this rafting trip in Australia with a bunch of friends. No, I was just surprised because I mean, in Canada, I can't, people don't go on rafting trips that I know for like living on rafts for two weeks. It seems very dangerous to me. Like, how did that work? 
Uh, well, we chose a very slow and relaxed river. Um, you probably wouldn't be allowed to okay. do it now nowadays. So we're talking, this is sort of back in the 1970s, so a fair while ago. Um, mm. And so we, we built the rafts ourselves. It was something that started off with seven of us and it ended up with um, 14 of us. So we start, started off, I think, with three rafts and ended up with seven as the word got back <laughs> to friends that what a great time we we're having it. And most of us did it for about three, three months. Um, the bagpipes I had discovered wow. actually just prior to that trip. Um, and so it was on that trip that I was like, listening over and over again to this album that I discovered and how I uh, fell in love with the Macedonian bagpipes was as simple as listening to uh, an album in a friend's record collection. I was staying over and mm-hmm. and I found this album and I went, mm, okay, that looks interesting, Macedonian folk dances. And I put it on and it was like instant love. I just fell in love with with the sound of of that instrument, of the guider of the Macedonian bagpipe. And I sort of knew pretty much straight away that I would somehow um, get to learn that that instrument. And and then on that raft trip, I sort of basically that cassette that I copy that I made of the album was on permanent rotating. (laughs) <laughs> every day and and yeah. then so it so happened then that that the following year I ended up um going to to Europe and ended up living in London for two and a half years making in, in instruments musical instruments and uh found a, a group of musicians who were playing that music and managed to borrow some Macedonian bagpipes and eventually went to Macedonia and and found a teacher and when you got there, I understand your van broke down and then you, you had this three-month immersion living That's right. with your teacher. Yeah, well, it, it, in fact, it was lucky that the van broke down because myself and, and Adam Heilbrunn, who was a, another musician that I was playing with in London, he played the cabal, the, the end-blown flute, Macedonian end-blown flute. We decided that we wanted to go to Macedonia and find teachers of those instruments. And so we bought a combi and we were travelling across from London to Skopje, our destination, and the combi broke down on the coast of uh, Yugoslavia. And it was pretty much, we thought we'd be able to fix it, but it was um, pretty much irretrievably lost. And that was the best thing that happened. It could have happened really because the plan was to uh, live in that combi during the Macedonian winter, which would have been freezing. It was freezing. Uh, but it meant we had to look for accommodation. And in looking for that accommodation, we just happened to uh, find uh, somebody who had a, a granny flat. And not only did he have that granny flat, he was a, a, a Macedonian guider player. And he played and he just recently retired. He had a lot of time on his hands. And um, I ended up learning from him for three and a half months. It was you know, he basically spent three hours every day with me for for that three and a half months, and uh, we bang, became very very close friends. He he he'd recently retired, but he'd retired fairly early uh, because of an injury, and um, it, in the in the long term anyway. Uh, how many years? Two years after that, I ended up bringing him to Australia and um, as part of a group orchestra, Grupa Pechalbari, and and we we and he ended up living over in my place for a couple of months. Yeah. And in terms of acquiring the language, how mm-hmm. did that work for you? Uh, just basically pretty poor street Macedonian, which I sort of still maintain. It's still at a very beginner's level, but it allows me to communicate and understand. Um, and we, uh, but basically started off with, with nothing. It was just um, lots of smiles and, Laugh, laughing at I don't know what <laughs> and but over that period of two and a half months I uh, learnt sort of basically street language uh, very very quickly it was very few people were speaking English in those days uh, well particularly where mm-hmm. I was was staying just outside Skopje. Mm-hmm. And since you grew up playing clarinet and uh, so do you, you didn't find the the embouchure too different like to playing the guider? Uh, oh, it's totally different because really the embouchure is uh, we're not looking at blowing. A, the, the reed is inside 
the bag really it's inside at the top of the chanter okay and and so it's really just you're just a it's a blowpipe so the the it's you're not really looking at, yeah. at an embouchure at all um and so but i i really did have to unlearn <laughs> a lot of the the classical uh way of thinking that that I had from um, my clarinet training just in, and, and it was a fantastic experience because it was, it's part of an oral tradition. And that's how I learned from, from Lazo. I had the advantage of having a cassette player. And, mm. and so in that three hours every day that we spent, I'd record and then the rest of the day I just practice. And it was the perfect learning situation really. Wow. And I was just thinking, cause you also, you studied um, the Greek, uh, Clarino, I'm not sure how mm -hmm. they say it, as, yep. as well as yep. another trip. Mm -hmm. Was that very different style of playing? Very, very, very different. And that For, was... Like that physically, was many... beyond the musical, I mean. Um, yeah, well, physically for sure. I mean, it's... Uh, so we're back, back to, you know, an embouchure that is similar, but but having to, to use a very different way of expressing and and so the embouchure changes because you need you're wanting a very open throat you're using and and that particular greek sound is what i was sort of striving for uh, never really getting it's interesting because that was let me think um 12 years later that i that i went to greece mm -hmm. uh, i'd stopped playing clarinet for a while um uh, and then I, but I had really fallen in love with the sound of the Greek and the Turkish styles of playing. And so I managed to find somebody uh, to teach me in the north of Greece in, in Serres, uh, Stavros Vestekis. And, and so I stayed there um, for, with um, Jess, my partner, and she was playing Darabuka, the, 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 the drum. And we were just lucky because... Stavros was just an in incredibly kind and generous teacher, but he also had a whole um, sort of group of friends that at least four nights a week would go out to different tavernas scattered around the countryside and we'd get to go with them. And, and many of them were musicians. So we'd, it was four nights a week. There was just this fantastic music that we were exposed to. And um, my my take up of the Greek language was definitely a lot slower than the Macedonian. I think I was a bit older by that stage, and also, uh, yeah. it's a it's a more difficult language. So, but we we communicated again again through smiles and jokes and and through music, and and that was also a great experience. Yeah, so Australia, like Canada, is a you know country of immigrants, and I found it really interesting part of your story that when you first got into Macedonian music, you didn't realize what a vibrant community there existed mm, already. Mm. That's it right. was just yeah. something over there. Can you talk about the experience when you first discovered that community back in Australia? <laughs> well, that, yeah, that's an, quite an interesting and funny story. Um, so, yeah, as you say, I was very ignorant when I went over. I'd fallen in love with the music, but I knew nothing really about the Macedonian community in Australia, which on coming back, I, find, uh, I found was a large, large community, half a million people um, in you know what is a, a big continent but with a small population even now we've only got around about 30 million uh and i came back from macedonia i was totally broke so i was out busking and i was busking with my guider with the macedonian bagpipes in front of uh, a cinema complex and um i did that sort of uh, fairly regularly when when i came back and one night a group of pretty tough looking guys sort of in the early twenties sort of came out and they um, surrounded me in, in a circle. And I thought, what, what's going on? And all of a sudden their arms came up and they started dancing to the music. And I went, Oh, okay. <laughs> they're obviously Macedonian. And then as soon as I finished the, the music, they came over, you know, you're, you're playing our music, you know, how come you're playing the guide? And, and so we got to talking and it turned out that a lot of them were um, from a, a dance group there. And I found out that there were, there were about 25 uh, different dance groups that, that, that they, they knew of. And that they turned out there were like 
literally dozens of Macedonian bands in Sydney, where I was living at the time, um, many dance groups. And then over a period of time, I got to um, be very much welcomed and accepted by the Macedonian community and found out a lot more about the, the whole Macedonian experience in Australia. And that then ended up inspiring me to to search a lot more in other other different communities and then led me to eventually setting up um, a centre for multicultural music uh, over in Perth um, that uh, yeah kept going. It doesn't exist now, but it went for 30 years and was a, a sort of a ve very important part of the growth of multicultural music in Australia. I wanted to say congratulations for setting that up. And it's I was so sad when I read the funding got cut and it's mm. it's just uh, such a tragedy. Yeah, unfortunately, that's, you know, that that's the problem with funding it. It's sort of um, certain things go in and out of fashion. Um, there there are other organisations that are doing similar things, but it's, uh, it's still, uh, when, I, when I set it up back in 1983, at the end of 83, uh, it was very much because I just believed that there was this amazing diversity of incredible music that most Australians were totally ignorant of and 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 were not exposed to and so i really wanted to set up a center which nurtured that music which acknowledged those musicians which paid those musicians properly rather than always um asking them to come and play for free at you know community events and so on which was the normal case and so the the center which in that first of all was um, called the North Perth Ethnic Music Centre then became known as the Multicultural uh, Arts Centre, WA, and then eventually became called Culture, K-U-L-C-H-A. And that lasted for 30 years. But there were groups like um, BMAC, the Brisbane Ethnic Music and Arts Centre in Brisbane, across the other side of Australia, well, sort of where I am now, a little bit south of here. Um, that that organisation set up directly in response to that first centre. And then there was also an organisation which is still going now in, in Melbourne, which set up about the same time called the Boite. Um, and so um, it was yeah, part of that sort of very early acknowledgement of the amazing cultural diversity that we have in Australia. Mm -hmm. There's so many um, tangents, but I'm if we can just go back a little bit to that First sure. trip to Europe, I found it, your whole London story quite interesting. So you were making Renaissance flutes, mm -hmm. yeah, and yeah. you set up a business to do so. Yes, because you bought a lathe and you were backpacking and you couldn't carry it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So to to go even a little bit uh, further back, um, when I left school, my yeah. plan was to study science, and and I took a year off and. During that year, I discovered a, a grove of bamboo and made my first bamboo flute. And again, that was another sort of instant love affair. Just the whole process of making one's own instrument uh, was for me very, very exciting. So I did start my uh, science degree and I did uh, did the first year of the science degree. And But by the time I'd sort of gone into the second year of the science degree, I was already um, starting to make a, earn a bit of a living by selling bamboo flutes. And I used to do that at the university outside the library. I'd sort of sit down, unroll my swag and put out the flutes on the ground. And 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 gradually I dropped back to part time and eventually then um, postponed my degree um, and started making wooden flutes as well, because I thought, ah, I want to take this a step further. Uh, I became interested in early music. I was making specifically Renaissance flutes um three different sizes a soprano alto and tenor uh, and then i was lucky enough to get a small grant to uh visit museums with important um, collections of early wind instruments uh throughout europe and i traveled um around europe for three months uh just visiting these wonderful collections of instruments and and making detailed measurements of those instruments with the idea of one day making copies of them. Uh, and the final museum that I went on that tour was the Horniman Museum in London. So I ended up in London and uh, walking through um, Clerkenwell uh, area with a, a lot of watchmakers. Um, I was just looking into a watchmaker's uh, shop and there was this beautiful old treadle wood lathe, wood turning lathe, cast iron, 
Uh, so like a treadle sewing machine, it's powered by just, you know, the, the, the mm. foot pedal. And it was for sale for £20. And I went, oh, that's ridiculous. It's so beautiful. And, and I did an impulse buy knowing that I had no way of taking it anywhere. I'd, I'd, I was backpacking and, and um, <laughs> so um, I was travelling with my girlfriend at the time. I said, do you want to stay in London for a while? <laughs> she was making reeds and so we both set up a workshop. She was making um, um, double reeds uh, for early winds and I was making uh, woodwind instruments. Uh, but first of all, uh, specifically Renaissance flutes and supplying uh, players and also the early music shop. Uh, and yeah, and that's how I sort of got to to um, end up staying in London for a, a bit, couple of years. Uh, and inadvertently, well, not so inadvertently, I guess it was also a, a desire to find other people, but finding other musicians who are interested in Macedonian music um, by finding a, a a Macedonian or Yugoslav dance group who danced the dances of uh, Yugoslavia, Serbia, Croatia, but particularly were interested in Macedonian music and dance. And just luckily there was this group of musicians already playing uh, music with that dance group. And, and then I became part of that uh, really vibrant sort of Macedonian music scene with, the, with those other musicians. Yeah. So Lindsay, I have a couple questions about that, but just, I was just curious, did you ever perform in the Renaissance world as a woodwind player or flutist or not? You weren't in the um, music? I was, I was, I definitely was playing it. Um, I, during that time in Europe, when I was traveling from museum uh, through the various museums, um, I also went to a summer school uh, in Austria and um, there was an instrument maker, John Hanchett, who is a, a very well-known um, early wind maker based in, in England. And he was running that course. And I actually made myself a, um, an alto kirtle. Um, so that's like a predecessor of the bassoon. But um, so it, at mm. that stage, they would have four four sizes, the, um, the bass kirtle or dulcian, uh, which became eventually became the bassoon. Uh, the tenor, uh, the alto, and the soprano kirtle, and so they're double double reed instruments with a parallel bore that doubles up on itself like the bassoon. Uh, and I played in an early um, music wind ensemble associated with the Early Music Centre in London. Uh, we weren't weren't performing; it was just something that you know I loved doing, and and so I I sort of got into playing the kirtle with that with that group. Yeah. Yeah. So cool. And you mentioned briefly before about uh, busking. So I know you busked mm -hmm. a lot across Europe. Mm. Was Did you ever have any, like you had mentioned that story, you were worried about aggression when it was actually friendly Macedonians, but did you have any yeah. experiences where people tried to steal from you or it was bad? No, no. With, with that trip, I wasn't busking so much in Europe. Um, later later on, on different trips, I busked a lot throughout Europe. Later, and, yeah. Yeah. Um, and always it was very friendly except one time in Zurich when the police took me into custody for a little while for um, playing a prohibited instrument <laughs> and I was playing the bagpipe <laughs> and the bagpipe was prohibited uh, and another time in Zurich when uh, a, a pot of um, of water was poured from the second sort of story balcony over my head yeah. and um, some local passers-by said oh you you were lucky um, it was it was it was more than water that was poured on the last busker. <laughs> oh. so, yeah, yeah. So that's unfortunate. The, um, but in London, I did quite a lot of busking, just usually with one of my little soprano um, folk flutes, uh, and okay. sort of added to to um, my income from the instrument making. Yeah. So back to Macedonia and the and dance groups. I'm curious. So did you learn some of the dances, and did, did that help you with the um, the rhythms, the polyrhythms? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, it really the dance and the music are sort of um, they're intrinsically linked. You know, there's not not one with the other. I mean, the the, the guider is very much uh, an instrument for dancing. Um, it's it's used also for for seeing, you know, for accompanying songs, but uh the 
the traditional dance very often is accompanied by a gaida and a tapan, that's a large Macedonian drum. And so when I was mm -hmm. with Lazo, um, he also taught me a lot of the dances to the tunes and I, and I notated all of those. Uh, and I had originally got into the music um, also partly from uh, learning the dancing. I had found a group, this is before I went uh, to Europe in, in Sydney, uh, there was a wonderful dance teacher, Gary Dawson, who's remained a, a close friend ever since then. And he um, taught regular weekly dances as part of a, the Sedenka uh, folk dance group. And it was through that group that I also started um, becoming aware of this amazing um, music from Eastern Europe, whether it was uh, Macedonian or Bulgarian or Romanian or from Greece. Uh, and that was my sort of first real exposure to that music. And so um, at the uh, Zivko Fiefov dance group in London that I was part of the band playing for, we'd also, all of us would be dancing as well when we weren't playing. Mm -hmm. And you also got interested in the Romani uh, brass band tradition, which mm -hmm. is different. That's right. Uh, there, so to take the story a little bit further, after returning from Macedonia, going back to London for a little while, the, the dance group, the Zivko Fiefov dance group, uh, were invited to go to Macedonia and perform at the um, a festival, large, large festival, Ilindensky Denovi festival in Bitola, one of the main towns in Macedonia. And the whole group, dance group, and the the musicians uh, all went, so this was six months after I returned from Macedonia, went back to Macedonia, but this time with with a group of about, must have been about 20, 20 of us. Uh, and we performed at that festival and through that festival met so many wonderful and amazing traditional musicians from villages and towns all over Macedonia and received countless invitations to come and visit if we were staying on. Well, a few of us did stay on, particularly myself and uh, a friend, Chris Gunston, who was uh, one of the tambura players in the Zhivko Fiefov group. And so we stayed on for um, a month or so and followed up those invitations. And one of those invitations was for, from a wonderful uh, musician, Romani musician, Destin Destinovsky from the town of Berevo. And so we went and, and stayed with the very hospitable Destinovsky family. And it was that, that was my introduction to that incredible um, uh, Romani brass band music, wild, improvisatory, mm -hmm. um, just, again, it was, I just totally fell in love with that. And, and later on when I returned in Australia, but maybe a, a decade later, um, I started uh, notating and writing uh, some of my own compositions in that style and and then also running workshops in that style of music and eventually mm -hmm. uh, having a 24-piece a uh, street band called The Unusual Suspects in where I'm living now here in Mullaney, uh, which went for about seven years until, until a few years ago, uh, playing in that style. And to extend that, that story, um, it was many years later that I finally returned to Macedonia after about a 30, 36, 37 year break. Uh, and unfortunately, by that stage, Destan, who really he and I had become like brothers. He, he had died only a f couple of years earlier. Um, but I became mm -hmm. very, very close friends with his two sons, Milo and, and Jaffa. And, um, and Milo and I organized so that um, I'd come back and, and stayed there. And I thought, no, I, I really, this music is so fantastic because I, when, when I returned in 2013, the music was more vibrant and alive than when I'd been there in, in 78 um, and also 81. Um, so we're talking about a, a big gap, but the music was as stronger than ever. And I thought, no, I've got, got to somehow get these musicians over to Australia. And so with the help of uh, a wonderful uh, folk music festival here in Queensland, the Woodford Folk Festival, uh, we brought 19 of those musicians across 
uh, for a couple of weeks to Australia to play at that festival, also in, in our town here in Mullaney and also down in, in Brisbane. And that was an extraordinary experience. Um, so the, yeah, that, that music also mm-hmm. had a big impact on me. There's so much cross-pollination in music in general. And I'm curious because some klezmer music I've heard has that, uh, you know, that brass band, uh, that Romani mm-hmm. sound. Have you yep. um, played with any klezmer musicians in Australia or elsewhere? Um, no, not not really. Um, um, there's I've, I've come across uh, klezmer musicians and there are, are some great musicians down in Melbourne in particular playing that music. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of, as you say, there's a lot of cross pollination, and you can see the roots of that of that music and and where it's come from, and and um, and for me, that's 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 the beauty of that music and how how it spreads and how it's shared, and and um, and for example, one one of the musicians who played clarinet in the Unusual Suspects was also very interested and had played in various Kletzma bands. Uh, yeah, so the, there's there's definitely that cross pollination happening over here as well. I saw a wonderful YouTube video with the unusual suspects that you guys had filmed, and mm-hmm. one of your friends was sort of dancing at like a sort of a clown figure and just yeah. engaging with the people. Yeah. Yeah, it was yeah. really wonderful. And you've done so much um, like performance art and theater and and humor as part of your shows, mm-hmm. like really meshed together. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, for me, that's that's an important part of it. A lot of my uh, we have sort of solo shows, um, which really were a, a major part of of my life and work. I guess since nineteen around sort of early nineties, uh, and the, and those solo shows have taken me all over the world and probably been my main bread and butter for a long while. But for me, that sort of sense of fun and humour is really important because it opens the possibility to, I guess, to a range of people who might not have been necessarily attracted to that style of music if it was being displayed on a concert stage. But when it's uh, brought in with that sort of element of, of fun and humour, uh, they're sort of more open to it. And then finally they realise that they actually do like this music, even though it's very different from anything they've heard before. Uh, so, I, yeah, I do certainly love adding that that element of sort of fun and and humor i mean even if it's sort of something um as as simple as making an instrument from a watering can or using a rubber glove uh to show people the uh, different possibilities that there are in terms of music making yeah i was um reminded i i i'd seen many some many of your videos have gone viral over the years especially your car- car- clarinet Mm. Um, but I was actually looking for a Duduk player for this series. And then I saw one of your Duduk videos and I was like, oh, of yep. course, I should talk to him if he'd possibly <laughs> agree to speak with me. It was just, um, so wonderful. And then I saw your video teaching people how to make a Duduk read from just a pipe, a plastic mm. pipe. It was just yep, yep. It's so inspiring. Yeah, yep. Would you be up for playing some Duduk music for us? Sure, sure, sure. Um, so the... the um... What's the best way to describe this? I've, I've again, I, the duduk is another instrument that I've sort of totally fallen in love with, and and I do have a number of Armenian duduks, but have never, bec- I guess, become um, um, a player of the Armenian duduk as such. But I became very interested in the idea of as an instrument maker, but because by the um, by the sort of the, the 1990s and the early 2000s and also for the last 20 years, um, I've been making instruments a lot from found objects. And so I wanted to come up uh, with an instrument that was very much like the duduk, but maybe using a reed that was a little bit easier uh, to make uh, and longer lasting. And so <laughs> um, here we've got it's basically a bit of irrig- plastic irrigation pipe or poly pipe, polyethylene. So um, here in Australia, we can buy 20 metres of this for $8. Um, and mm-hmm. this is pretty much the shape, you know, very similar shape to the Armenian uh, duduk reed, uh, which is made from cane. And that's what it sounds like by, by itself. Um, but 
when I put it on onto this tube. And so this is a particular instrument that I have um, designed, uh, which is based on the Armenian duduk. And, uh, but I've designed it so that I can use cross fingering like on a recorder to get a fully chromatic scale. So it's only got the range of a ninth, um, but using cross fingering, it, um, so it's, I can get uh, a chromatic scale. So this is uh, a hybrid duduk. Um, and the reed itself, um, I must uh, give credit um, to Javi Lozano. He's a, a wonderful Spanish uh, instrument maker. And in a way, he's very, we've got a very similar approach. He makes lots of instruments out of wind instruments, out of found objects. Uh, he loves the use of humor in his work. Uh, as well as being um, a maker, he also performs and makes his own videos. And I'd been mucking around with this, this idea with making these duduk reeds out of polypipe, but fairly unsuccessfully. And then one day I came across a video of his, a TED talk, where in three minutes he made a reed very similar to that. And so I thought, oh, I'm going to try again because he just did it in three minutes. And so... Uh, his approach was a little bit different. He used a hammer uh, to flatten this out, whereas I'd been sort of squeezing it and sanding it and, and so on. And so I tried his technique and straight away there was more success. And then I sort of thought, I think there's actually ways also of improving this and, and let's try and make it sound more like the Armenian Duduk. So I'll give you a, a listen to what it sounds like. I might just uh, give myself a, a drone just to, to work with and also I'll just turn around and turn that on. So beautiful, Lindsay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about improvisation because you imp you're such a beautiful improviser and you, you all the styles of music with improvisation have attracted you for so long. But when mm. you were growing up doing, I presume, classical clarinet, mm -hmm. when you were a young man, yep. were you doing any, like just making stuff up or writing music? Um, yeah. So I, I started uh, learning clarinet when I was about 11 and, and went through about, um, yeah, nine years of classical training. Um, but like a lot of kids uh, all through high school, I sort of played, had uh, a few different bands and more and more those mm. bands uh, got involved in, improv in improvising. At first, I guess, in a sort of a jazz, jazz style. One of the people that I played with was quite a good um, jazz pianist. Uh, and we had a, <laughs> our first band, which was in the first year of high school, uh, was called, was called the Hooten Twangers. 
<laughs> and then we had a, a group called the Rajas, R A J A double Z. And then we were basically sort of playing contemporary pop, a mix a mixture of sort of Rolling Stones and, and Beatles sort of stuff, but also giving it, a, I guess, a bit of a, a jazz twist. But by the time I got to the final years of high school, I had discovered um, contemporary sort of, I guess, more sort of contemporary, serious contemporary classical music. Uh, and my first, I guess, really ex huge excursion imp improvisation was deciding, and this was when, uh, I think it was in my final year of high school, deciding to put on a, um, a performance um, of The Tiger's Mind by Cornelius Cardew. So that is a, a, a was well at that stage was a very contemporary um, work, uh, but it was the score was a story, and it was about the tiger Amy, um, the mind. Um, I'm trying to think of all of the, the different characters, but he, each uh, performer um, represented one of those characters, and the score was basically the story of how the, the mind, the tiger and Amy, the girl, uh, intertwined. And uh, we ended up doing two performances of that. And so that was sort of uh, sort of the first excursion publicly that I did into sort of very free improvisation. Um, but I always have been interested in improvisation and have just explored this sort of different different ways and different styles of doing that, I guess. Um, I wanted to ask you about your live looping because you were a real pioneer when you started this in the early mm -hmm. 90s and the technology mm -hmm. was very primitive, right? Very primitive. <laughs> um, I first um, started looping when uh, I moved from Sydney where, where I was living um, and Jess, my partner, um, who we've been together for 36 years, we just... Uh, one of her sons had been living with her down in Adelaide, but then moved back up to Queensland and another son was living up uh, in Queensland. So we moved um, back to Queensland where Jess had originally been living and we lived in or moved to a very small town of 300 people called Kinkin. And we actually were living there for 19 years until about 10 years ago. Um, but of course, I, it meant that I left all my musical colleagues behind me in, in Sydney and I thought, well, what am I going to do? And I came across uh, a woman who had a, a, sh a performance name of um, Violinda and she did a, a solo looping show. And that was the first looping, live looping that I'd seen. And this is back in the 19, in 1990. And so I, I sort of thought, oh, maybe that's what I, let, let's try that. And at that stage, the, as you said, the, temp the technology was, was very quite primitive. And my first looping device was a, a delay pedal that had a hold function and that ho that hold function gave me a 1.8 second long loop <laughs> and so my first solo show was totally built around a 1.8 second loop um i've got no idea what that sounded like now many years later um but then over, over the next 30 years i've sort of developed um a whole range of different solo looping shows which um, as we were talking before, um, involved sort of an element of fun and particularly was based around the whole concept of instruments made from found objects. So um, the, that very first show was called Bang Up With A Fork and I was a, a kid at the sink uh, doing his the washing up and everything was made from from the sink and all of the pots and pans and everything in the, in the sink, as well as a few wind instruments uh, that were made from, from found objects. Uh, the next um, show mm -hmm. after that was called Knocking on Kevin's Door, uh, where I was a roadie setting up for, for a gig, uh, totally ignoring the audience for one hour. But as I set up in the guise of Kevin, uh, the roadie, he created music from all of the stuff that he was setting up, whether it's the music stands, the microphone stands, the gaffer tape, uh, the, the music folders or what, whatever. Uh, the next show after that was called The Art of Food and I was a crazy chef called Ivan and all the music was made from <clears throat> food or 
or kitchen utensils. And that was where the, the first sort of carrot clarinet sort of raised its its head and um, I've ended up using that for many years. So, um, yeah, that was sort of basically uh, the looping that sort of developed um, sort of over that over that period of time and and also as the technology evolved i would move from from one different looping setup to another and 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 right now i've sort of am am still doing some looping but um not with a, a sort of a the the current solo show that that i was working on earlier this year i've um is a little bit different because that's really that's called uh, searching for that sound, which is a little bit like this um, podcast in a way. It's like me sort of telling about my journey and playing music along the, the way, and it's from stepping from instrument to instrument, but also using some looping. Wow, that sounds great. Um, I was thinking how um, I loved your, your thing you do with the bicycle. So brilliant. I yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, was that part of one of those shows, or was that a totally separate? Yeah, that was one of those shows. So that was show. The, the show. Yeah, the show was called okay. Psycho- Psychology, as in cycle, C Y C L O G Y, uh, yeah. and and um, and in that um, performance, my character was Professor Squealy Deepum, who was uh, basically lecturing on the possibilities of the bicycle as a performance tool or instrument but he had also had a sidekick called Dietrich and Dietrich um sort of op- opened the show and and then Squealy Miss Professor Squealy Deep Bum took over <laughs> actually that I brought that over to, to Canada at one stage I'm sorry I missed it where, where were you touring in Canada uh mainly up in the in the northeast yeah, so right up, right up to Prince Prince Edward Island. Um, so, but ma- yeah, mainly in the okay. Quebec province. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, the the agent who was running it at that stage was and, based in in Montreal. Okay, and you don't normally I, do you speak in these shows, or is it just all miming and music? Um, so the early shows um, were very much. Um, more about the music and the mime with just occasional key expressions, which became um, a very important part of each show. Uh, and some of the, the character, Ivan the chef, uh, grunted a lot and exclaimed and and certain exclamatory remarks. Um, the squealy deep bum... Of the professor spoke in a very very high pitched voice, which was gobbledygook. Um, but um, after around about the first five shows, uh, then there was a lot lot more talking, and it became less character based and more about demystifying the whole process of making music and making instruments. And so I used language uh, and talking quite specifically about the instruments and uh, to inspire people to have a go themselves, basically. In terms of looping, during the pandemic, I get the impression a lot of people were isolated and started to experiment with looping who hadn't, you know, who were looping curious. Yeah. Did you get people asking you advice about that? Um, Actually, no, not not really. I mean, over over the years, of course, I've I've run quite a lot of looping workshops and and I have uh, noticed that you know, through the pandemic that, that did happen, but I haven't had so many, I think now because there's so much online, um, people can sort of explore it quite, quite easily online. Yeah. And there's, um, Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of pretty transparent in, in so many ways now because of, of the amount of information there is now available. Did you bring any instruments today that are with found objects? Uh, yeah, yep, yep. Um, we could explore the bagpipe theme. <laughs> so, um, whatever you'd like. Uh, well, let's let's do that. Seeing we started with the the Macedonian bagpipe, mm-hmm. so obviously I've I've got this peculiar attraction to to bagpipes, or not so peculiar. Um, but I discovered uh, quite early on, quite a, in my very very early shows, and particularly uh, shows that I took onto the streets of Europe. 
um, created different bagpipes using rubber gloves because the beauty of a rubber glove is it it holds air um, and because it's rubber and flexible as it expands it provides its own pressure and so it, it's this wonderful bag that you don't actually have to be pressing with your arm and so I've created a number of different types of of bagpipes with with the rubber glove <laughs> so it's very simple basically just like the Macedonian bagpipe or other bagpipes you you blow in that's your bag it's sort of self pressured because of the 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 rubber uh, this is what this is the most recent uh, version I've made of rubber glove bagpipe so it's got a, a drone here the interesting thing about these um, uh, the chanter and the drone is that um, well I won't pull it off because it's going to put it out, a little bit out of tune but um, the reeds that I'm using are membrane reeds so it's basically uh, some plastic garbage bag which has been stretched over the top of the tube the air goes in into the um, into the bag and then comes back out through these tubes here one into the the drone and one into the chanter uh, and it's the the vibration of that plastic garbage bag membrane on the top which is creating this sound For those listeners who are listening to the podcast, you should definitely go to the video afterwards just the, for the humor value of seeing that giant glove <laughs> blown up. Did you get that idea from somebody else or did, did you just come up with it? Um, well, I, ca I came up with that idea. I mean, other people, other people in, so since then I've seen other people who have been using that idea. Um, I first, mm -hmm. I think, used the rubber that, it was in the again in the early 90s it was a very that was a a time of um great ferment i think for me that was mm -hmm. i'd moved to queensland um i'd left behind as i said a lot of musician friends and so i was sort of exploring and discovering i was getting into instrument making and that's i was mainly earning my living as an instrument maker uh but then i started developing the solo shows and so uh the rubber glove bagpipe was sort of um right from the very first, that very first show with the kid at the kitchen sink, the, um, mm -hmm. uh, called bang it with a fork, uh, that actually had, um, because that was all about washing up because the kid was washing up. And so he had the rubber gloves and the gloves actually were built into the, into the sink and they came up out of holes and blew up. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. 
I was thinking how um, I really enjoyed those recordings you've made. I think you live near a, a beautiful forest and you go mm. early in the morning and you record. Um, yeah. and, and we hear the ambient sounds. It's not like many people are superimposing mm. field recordings. This is live. Yeah, that, that's correct. And um, the amazing thing is that, that uh, I recorded a whole album that way and I just discovered that the, the microphone in my iPad Pro uh, was actually incredibly good, <laughs> good, good way of recording in that in that context, uh, and that's all I'm using. I'm actually just using the iPad with the onboard microphone, and uh, nothing overdubbed. So it's just picking up the bird sounds with uh, whatever wind instrument I chose mm -hmm. to play on that particular day. The only thing that was pre-recorded was that I just had a drone um, that I was listening to, and then was part of the recording, but. Um, basically the the instrument that I'm playing and the birds is just all being just recorded from that little iPad mic mm. uh, and yeah there's one a whole album of of those tracks and it's something that I'm uh, planning to do a lot more of in the next in the in the coming year just doing sunrise concerts uh, just inviting people to mm. to come along and, and just picking beautiful locations with great bird calls I, I did listen to the album and also your album with the frog sound that, that somebody else had recorded an entire album. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's right. <laughs> that's the, uh, done a little bit differently. So the, the uh, frog sounds are recorded by a fantastic um, naturalist and, and frog and bird expert who, who's recorded a lot of Australian frogs, David Stewart. And I've used those sounds with his permission um, to then in a, as with a sampler and then then created music using that sampler you have such a great sense of groove you know your music a lot of it's so rhythmic and you've worked in a duo for many years with mm -hmm. your percussionist friend let me remember his name tunji Bayer. that's right yeah, tunji. that's right yeah 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 uh, yeah, we worked together uh, as the duo Deva, which is the Macedonian Macedonian word for two. Um, and so for about 20 years, we, we played as duo. We're now actually uh, playing with another friend, um, uh, Philip Griffin, a fantastic string player. And so the three of us are now playing as a, tr as a trio. That's a fairly new current project. It's simply called the, the Bayer Griffin Pollock Trio. Mm -hmm. um, and... That's so. That's along with Tunji, wonderful percussionist who, when he was sixteen, took himself to South India to Bangalore and studied for three years South Indian percussion there. And Philip Griffin, who's a, a wonderful string player, playing a huge range of different string instruments, but uh, as in particular the instruments like the oud and the lauto, as well as electric bass and and guitar and the Afghani rebab. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And have you learned any of that hand percussion, like from Tunji? Does he taught you any of that? I was just curious. Since um, I've I've always been interested in, in and played a bit of percussion, but never um, when you have a percussionist as amazing as Tunji, mm. yeah, I'm very happy just to <laughs> sit on the, sit on the winds and and uh, yeah and play along. And so yeah, I haven't I haven't actually specifically had had lessons or or learnt from him, um, but just collaborated a lot on the music yeah. that we create together. I wanted to talk about your um, Hugh Marimba project. Mm -hmm. So again, uh, with my fascination for making instruments um, and making them simple, I, I, I've i always loved the marimba and the xylophone, but particularly the marimba and had the idea that it would be a wonderful community instrument but one of the difficult things when traveling around and running workshops is with a marimba, it's a big instrument. Um, and a lot of that bulk um, and weight is to do with the stand that's holding up the, the keys. And one morning I woke up and I went, mm, but what if the people playing were the stand? And so I, I got the idea of, of hooking a marimba onto belts of two players, one at each end, and developed a whole style of uh, marimba music, um, of which I've written a lot um, for the various workshops and groups that I've run. 
where the music is three part marimba music uh, played by three people, one on each end and one in the middle. And first of all, I, I um, really was more involved in running, making workshops so people could make their own marimbas. And then more and more got into um, writing and composing music, which uh, people who'd never played before could could handle and and gradually build that. And then when I moved to uh, Kin Kin, as I mentioned before, moved up to Queensland, I guess after about uh, being there for nearly 10 years, yeah, it was about 10 years, um, I was approached um, by uh, one of the, the mums from the local school uh, saying, would you t teach our kids to play marimba? Because they knew that I'd sort of travelled all over Australia running these workshops. And they also knew of the the band that my partner Jess and I and, and our two closest friends, Mick and Ali, we had a band called Xylosax, which was based all around the, the Hugh Marimba, um, plus other instruments that I brought into the group. Uh, and they said, would you, would you teach our kids? And I said, well, you know what? I I think I'm going to say no. What I'm going to say is that I'll teach the parents. I said it's it's a very um, unnatural thing for kids to learn something before the parents. So why, why don't we do it in a more traditional manner where it's something that can be then, you know, sort of passed on? I said I'm I'm going I'll, I'm very happy to teach teach the parents and then let's wait until the kids themselves want to play. I don't want you to want them to play. I want the kids to really have a hunger for, to do it themselves. So we, um, I started running classes and, and a group called K Karimba um, started, which ran for seven years. Um, eventually was when I left Kin Kin, it was taken over um, by one of the, the people that I'd been teaching. And we had an, always would have pretty much 24 people in that group. So it was, a, we, over the seven years, it would um, eventually develop so that we were out sometimes out performing. Um, but every Tuesday night in this small town of 300, uh, we had um, 24 people playing. And that, and sometimes people left the group, but there were always people who came in. So I worked out that over the period of those seven years, we had 40 people uh, from, kin, from Kin Kin playing. Well, that's over 10%. So I think that pretty much that was the marimba hotspot on the planet. <laughs> when you look at the number of people playing playing marimba in that in that town, um, certainly 10 ten percent of the yeah. town were playing marimba, uh, and that was yeah that was a very um, a mainstay of my community music making for for quite a while. I've done um, you know my one of my big passions is is teaching people to make their own instruments and make their own music and the the humor imba was perfect for that because it was an instrument that anyone can make um and there was one point where um a music festival it's now called the queensland music festival at that stage it was called the brisbane biennial back in 1995 uh they commissioned me to, for, to do a project uh to within the community make a whole lot of marimbas enough so that we could put them right across the Brisbane River, which is a wide river. So we made uh, 160 marimbas that went end to end attached to the railings of this bridge that went across the river. And for nine days of the festival, those marimbas were up for people to play. And then they went back to the the families or the the people who'd made them. So we had um, over the ten weeks that the workshop was open, we made um, I think there was two thousand four hundred marimba bars were made and tuned, <laughs> and uh, I've forgotten how many people exactly, but I think we, had, we we yeah we had a huge number of people in, involved in in making them from eleven years old to to ninety one years of age. Wow, it's such a such a beautiful story. I saw a um, video of that that project. Mm. The tuning, I mean, that must take such finesse. I mean, if you cut it off too short, it's too high. You have to start again. <laughs> um, well, there, yeah, there's a few things involved. So the length, as you said, the length is important, but that's quite easy because that um, I 
all the measurements I'd, I'd worked out all the measurements for these instruments we yeah. were using a particular it's different depending on the on the instrument but actually that most of the tuning is done by how much you cut away underneath so the more you cut away the lower the note um so there was yeah. one for example just for example i um designed a, a children's show um where all the whole set was musical instruments made from different things so the garden fence in one in in there were four houses side by side and the garden fence on on one of the houses was a total marimba but all the lengths were all the same and so i managed to get a okay. two oct two octaves um just by the amount that was cut out from underneath from just that same length so it is possible to actually tune it that way but yeah so it's more the the fact that when you're actually um cutting away underneath or you're just using a tool called a surform which is sort of just like a big handheld rasp uh you get to a point where you've just got to start being slowing down on the amount that you're taking taking away so as you get to within a semitone of 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 the sound that you want of the note that you want then you know to to slow down yeah there, there were th there were three of us that were running uh the workshops there so the, and the workshops were open um for that 10 week period and yeah basically the, the main <laughs> job you had in that workshop was keeping an eye who's getting close to, who's within a semitone of the note that they're going for and they're getting getting them to sort of to slow down on on their work um but yeah it's a, it's a really great a uh, way to gain an understanding about pitch and the relationship of pitch to length and uh, in terms of bar, um, bar uh, percussion instruments or tuned percussion, great to get an understanding of, about that that cutaway and and how that slows down the rate of vibration as you cut more from the center. Mm -hmm. What what a beautiful thing! What happened to that fence? Uh, that fence, mm, I don't know. We just it's interesting. That show was back again in the early nineties. And we just about two months ago had a reunion of all the people that were in that show. And so there was the, the instruments, yeah, ended up being scattered around uh, many of us. And, um, but I still, uh, from the big marimba project, the one that went across the, the Brisbane River, um, I still have a number of those uh, marimbas still with me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was just thinking, I mean, the installation, it should be in a some kind of public place or museum where, I mean, the work that went into building that garden fence, that's a, a musical instrument. It's an amazing thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> so you've done so much um, theater, like you had studied some theater, right, early in your career. Uh, no, no, helped no. You. I've no, I've never no? studied studied theatre. It's just sort of you know something I guess I've I've picked up along along the road, sort of creating okay. shows and working with other people and and being lucky enough to have that, the op opportunity to work with to, with some fantastic people. And so I've sort of learned over many years. Just really, I mean, for example, that that performance um, out of the frying pan um, with uh, was a cast of five of us. Um, but just working with a fantastic lighting designer, fantastic theatre set designer, fantastic director, um, those sort of things you learn, you know, you learn from those people that you, you're working with. So that first show, that was one of the, the first really big shows that I, that was in the Brisbane Concert Hall. So it was, um, it was a show for three to eight year olds. And um, yeah, that was, I'd never done a performance quite like that but that ended up touring all over Australia that particular performance uh and then since then I've sort of created great works but sort of learning learning as I go a lot and learning from other people and collaborating mm. and uh yeah so it's it's just one of those okay. things that it's a lovely way it's a lovely way to learn yeah and um you had this uh group the paranormal music society where you would improvise mm -hmm with audience participation for the titles and the, the themes that's right yeah yeah so the paranormal music society um were well along with romano Cravici, a very very 
old and dear friend and another great friend, Blair Greenberg. And we, as you said, um, pretty much the whole performance was improvised based on title suggestions from the audience so they could make up whatever title they liked and we'd have we'd create a piece of music based around that but it also created uh music from throwing a giant dice somebody from the audience would throw the dice and on the six uh, sides of the dice there were musical notes and mm -hmm. so might throw it once a throw it again g throw it again another g throw it again okay. c and throw it again fifth time E and that five note musical theme then would be the basis of that piece. Uh, and so that was, yeah, totally improvised piece. And a lot of my projects have, have been very firmly based in improvisation. Another of those projects was a piece, uh, project called QWERTY. I was going to ask you about that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for me, that's one of the most incredible um, improvised projects that I've been involved with. So again, there was, it was a trio, three of us. Uh, Peter Rowe um, has autism and Down syndrome. As a result of that, can't speak. However, he's got um, an incredibly brilliant mind. And luckily, and he, he can communicate through a process called facilitated communication. Unfortunately, he no one found out until he was 30 that, um, you know, that really that there was this amazing, active, uh, incredible intellect um, until he was able to um, be shown this means of communication. And basically facilitated communication is, it's like a QWERTY keyboard, but just on a, can be just on a, a cardboard board or a wooden board. And, and Peter or whoever's um, communicating points to the letters on the board and spells out the words. And um, with practice, that can be incredibly fast. And I met Peter as part of another project um, and we created a, a theatre performance using that uh, facility uh, where two of the performers would write songs on stage live and then their facilitators would sing the word. So we created a trio um, where his facilitator was also a, a great singer and Peter would write the words. We'd have no idea what the song was going to be about. Uh, sometimes I'd start the music. So I was using again, live looping, but I was using also uh, a MIDI wind controller. So I had a huge range of sounds through the MIDI wind mm -hmm. instrument uh, and then live looping those and, and, then working with Peter's words and with um, Delaney, who was uh, singing those words. If you can imagine being a singer, singing the words that you've just read, mm. as you're singing them, you're having to watch the next line that's being created at the same time as singing the previous line. So it's um, an, an amazing sort of feat really. And just the, the whole process, even to, well, I was saying even to me from being inside the group, I think, but probably especially for me being inside the group, it was, it was always exhilarating and, and incredible just sort of being part of that process of walking on stage and not having an absolute clue where it was going to go over the next hour. So beautiful. My mom worked at a children's hospital and I remember she, this was in the 80s, talking about that technology, which I think was relatively new at that time and how it was opening up these children's yeah. worlds. Yeah, 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 and it's, it's wonderful. You, you mentioned the MIDI wind controller. You have a something you've developed, like lyre bird, I think you call it, because it imit to imitate different sounds that you've used in some of your new work? Uh, the, well, the MIDI wind controller is that I use is a, um, quite an, an, old, an older version. It's a, a Yamaha WX-5. Mm -hmm. Lyrebird is just my name for that instrument. Yeah. So I, I haven't developed it. It's just, it's an off the shelf okay. um, wind controller made by Yamaha called it WX5. Okay. But uh, I'm using it differently in that um, the project that I've been doing with a wonderful singer, um, Lizzie O'Keefe, we've been working together uh, for eight years on a project called Dangerous Song. And I'm using the MIDI wind controller to, to play the sounds of uh, endangered species. So 
there um, in the same way that I use frog sounds on that album that you mentioned before. Mm. Here I'm using the sounds of a whole range of endangered species and it's basically a project that is using our art form uh, to ex express our response to the current sixth extinction crisis. Uh, and so we've done you know, num a number of different multimedia shows and, and many concerts using mm -hmm. those sounds and again, using live looping, uh, but use, because the wind controller using breath and I can control the length of the note, um, which follows obviously the, the cry or the sound of the animal, I uh, can use uh, that incredibly emotive sound of, of, you know, like some of the gibbons, for example, and lemurs and uh, various animals that use the melodic nature of their core uh, to create the, mel the melody as well as the six octaves that I can play using that um, MIDI wind controller, use, but using those sounds. So you must have studied the sounds of these uh, animals quite a bit to be able to do that? Uh, well, I, rather, I guess rather than studying them, yeah, I've, I've collected them over, over m many mm. years. Um, and there are m many of those sounds are available online now and, and many more now than there were, say, when I, 15 years ago when I started doing it. Uh, so there's yeah, an mm -hmm. extraordinary range of just fantastic sounds. And of course, as I'm collecting them, we always uh, are studying like those species who sounds that they were using to get a, a sense of uh, why they're becoming extinct, where, where they are, yeah. where the ones that we've lost and, and so on. Yeah. Yeah. I, but you must have a really amazing um, oral memory to be able to, it just strikes me in general that you must have a, a great musical memory. Um, in, which, in which sense do you mean in terms well, of? Well, even these, these animal calls, Lindsay, that you could remember mm. them so well and re be able to yep. reproduce them. Most people couldn't do that. Um, well, I guess I'm not having to reproduce them because the calls are right there. So it's just a matter of me dialing them up on the iPad. So just so, okay. uh, yeah. So um, how it works is that I collect the sounds. So there's a whole okay. range of sounds and then I might tweak a sample so that I know from a 27 minute second recording, I've got, okay, this three seconds is going to be musically really useful. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so let, let's say the Indri Indri, which is a giant lemur from Madagascar, which is critically endangered. It's got this extraordinary sort of voice that's sort of um, very, very melodic and, and long calls. Now I could use you know, say 10 seconds of that call or five seconds, but that in a way is too long to be able to, to work in a, in the way that we're working with the music mm -hmm. we're creating. So I might use just three seconds of that call and then that's stored in the iPad in a particular program mm -hmm. that I'm using called Thumb Jam, uh, which is also a live looping program. So it's it was sort of <laughs> made for me really, uh, uh, even though it wasn't. So those sounds are stored in the iPad. The, the MIDI wind controller, which is just basically like a, a clarinet, but it's, it's controlling those sounds. So it's like a synthesizer, but with um, breath control. Um, I, when I play a particular note, it's going to play that pitch oh, okay. of that sound. So if I play an A, I've, I've set it up so that I know I'm going to get an A the injury injury is going to the, the very attack, the attack of its call is going to be an A. It might I... move, it might move off the A over the next few seconds. So if I just blow very sh a short note, I'll just get, Ooh. I'll just get that the very, how long I blow determines how much of the call is used. Then I can play melodically. So I can play a melody using that animal's voice, but I can also by changing the length of my breath on each of those notes, it gives me different degrees or lengths of that animal's call. It's a little oh, bit hard okay. to sort of, yeah, I, I should have actually have it set up here so I could sort of, you know, no, show you, you how described it, works. it yeah. very well and people can listen to your recordings. No, I misunderstood that, that somehow you were imitating live. Yeah, no, it's the, it, yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's the actual sound. It's the actual, so yeah. I've got all of, all of those are stored in a program. 
and I can okay. and and I can access them very and change very very quickly and live loop them very very quickly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But I still think you must have a great musical memory because you've learned so many different styles over the years and so many traditional tunes and, and modes. And Yeah, well, the, the, that's true because if I'm using that Indri Indri sound, I've got to know exactly how it sounds um, um, so that it's not just this random sound that comes out. I know I need to know how I can use that call yeah. at, at each pitch because I might be dropping that pitch by say two octaves because I want mm. to use it as a bass sound. So in that sense, I might be using just like half second lengths of that first of, of that bass sound, but I'll be playing melodically. So I might loop a bass line with it, but then later on, I might be actually using the longer aspect of the, the call to create or partly create the memory, the, the me sorry, partly create the melody. Wow. Yeah. It's mm. a very beautiful, um, project that's very very poignant and when that the, your name for it the live lyre bird I, lyre birds are those birds that make they can imitate chainsaws and cell phone that, rings and all that right yeah that's right yeah 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 that, do well, they live in Aus in australia or yeah 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 okay yeah, yeah, yeah. have you heard they're, them before um i've never heard them i've never been lucky enough to hear one live they're not they're not sort of mm. common common but they're not they're not um you know it's i know many people who have heard them yeah. Mm -hmm. Where do you where do you want to go from? Well, what what do you have there? <laughs> well, I might just do that sort of description of how it works and and build a piece so I can that and that way we can we can look at some live looping as well. Wonderful. Uh, so with dangerous song, uh, this is the instrument. Uh, which I call Lyrebird, but it's a, mm -hmm. a Yamaha WX5 wind controller. Um, so I've got the different sounds stored in, in the iPad and the WX5 or Lyrebird is connected so I can control the sound. So if I play the full call, So that's the full call or an octave up, octave down. I can use it at bass, two octaves down. So I can do something like this, for example. another loop layer So that gives you just a very simple idea how the loop's built up. So if I select now a different instrument, if I go to say Blackiston's Fish Owl, so once again, I can play it very short or the full call. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Beautiful. So was that first call that you used at the end, was that a whale or? No, that, that um, after Blackerson's Fish Hour, I changed to this one, which is um, a black cockatoo. So it's a oh. Carnab Carnaby's black cockatoo, which comes from over in West Australia. Um, so it's uh, endangered because of habit uh, habitat loss. So it's, it originally or still is living in an area which is a wheat growing area. And so with as the, the wheat growing has taken out and wiped out uh, the natural bushland, that's reduced the amount of, of natural habitat of that particular um, cockatoo. So the, the beautiful birds, we've got a number of different types of black cockatoos around Australia. And, and that's one of the endangered ones. So, yeah, so that, I mean, I had no idea what I was going to create then I just sort of put something just very simple down with this, those two bird sounds um, yeah. but that sort of gives you an idea of, of the live looping combined with those animal sounds and so the the original pitch of that in uh, of uh, bird call so that re repetition is actually the bird itself so I'm just it, I'll I'm doing a very long breath So that was that sort of five or six calls was all, all one one call from that animal. But then I can take it down. So I can use it in that just using those short breaths as a melodic way, but then I can use it in a more emotive way using the full call. Um, earlier on, I mentioned the Indri Indri the Madagascan lima. So that's the original pitch. And then I can use it. Hopefully that gives an idea. Yeah. Did you have that idea percolating for a long time before you started to use it? Um, I guess it developed. Um, it, it probably was percolating in, in a way and just trying different, you know. So, for example, the frog music uh, was created from the samples, not not using this instrument, but using a sampler and it was used percussively. So using a, uh, where I'm using just triggering samples on the sampler. Um, mm -hmm. Then when I, when I um, first started experimenting with this, I had a bit of a love hate relationship with it because I, I just longed for a more acoustic and more organic sound. And then I sort of thought, well, what if I experiment with animal sounds? Um, that's going to give me a more, um, you know, just because of the, the flexibility in the way that, the the calls move it, it's going to be uh straight away it's going to be more emotive and more 
uh, organic in in the sort of sounds, even though it's you know it's digital because it's it's uh, it's stored as a sample. Mm -hmm. And so I I started with with that idea, and then I sort of thought, just because of my ecological concerns, just uh, looking at. Uh, a musician's and artist's response to the current extinction crisis, I came up with the idea of a show called The Extinction Room. So it was originally a solo show uh, and all the audience wore headphones and I was in the centre of the circle, uh, but the audience were all facing outwards away from me. So I was in, mm. in the middle of them and and all my gear was in the centre with all of the leads going to the, the headphones. I originally had um, 20 different sets of headphones and hmm. I took that show over that was uh, commissioned by a festival in Singapore and and did that over there and it, but everyone was blindfolded so that they were just oh, wow. tot so they had um a, a total good quality audio audio stereo audio sound of what was going on but and no external visual hmm. sensors so uh and that that was the first time that I used those and that I did that out for a couple of years. And then I still was a little bit dissatisfied with, um, even though they're the real sounds of the animals, it still had a very digital quality to it. And, I, and then I just had the idea of combining with, with a singer. And hmm. initially I did a, a project, um, a big outdoor project. It was an outdoor show called the dream of Zed cat Naboo and that used four singers. Um, but it was a big production and, and I realised it, it would be hard to sort of keep remounting. And I thought, oh, it would be nice just to do a stage show where it was just with a number of singers, but where we weren't having to build a set every time we wanted to mm -hmm. do the show. And and then I met Lizzie coincidentally around that time and, and thought, um, do you want, you know, I asked her, invited her to come and have a jam in the studio thinking that maybe she could be one of those singers and I'd, I'd never, re I'd heard her singing some jazz and, and she had a great voice and we, with the unusual suspects, the, that sort of gypsy Romany brass band sort of style, one night we were playing at a festival, it was New Year's Eve and, and the, Jimmy, the trumpet player in the, in the band said, oh, there's Lizzie, in, um, get her to come and sing in, with us. And I'm thinking, that's not really fair on her. We've got a, uh, you know, cruddy little microphone going through a little speaker um, where we've got five percussionists and, you know, 17 brass players. It's not really a fair thing, but I thought, oh, why not? It's New Year's Eve. Let's do it. And anyway, she, she got on mic and, and just blew me away. And I sort of thought, oh, okay. This, maybe she, you know, maybe she might be one of those, those singers. So um, she came into right here where we are, where I am at the moment. And, mm. um, and we had a jam using these sounds and with me doing the sorts of work that I'd been doing in the extinction room, the solo show and straight away, it just became obvious that I said to Lizzie, I'd love to work with you on this if you're interested. And she said, yeah, I'd love to. And, and then at that point I thought, well, actually I think one sing is enough. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and so we've been working yeah together for, for the last eight years on that. Collaboration is so, so wonderful. And of course, so many of us were so isolated uh, in the earlier part of the pandemic. Mm. And so much of the work you've done in community music over the years is just convincing everybody that we're all musicians. You can mm. make your own instruments. You can use your voice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, for, for me, that was probably the, the main through line of my work and, and the, my love for music was um, just exactly as you've articulated then. That's exactly what I was on about. And then as, as well as that, you know, I love creating my own work. And so it's been a mixture of those things throughout, I guess, doing um, running workshops and showing people how they can make their own music. And that, you know, for me, that's the joy is, you know, I love listening to great music and, but the real joy comes from playing at playing it and playing with others and so uh, and I've wanted to share that and through the instrument making and showing people how to make their own instruments um, that's another part of the I guess the demystifying process of um, just that joy of making not only making your own music but making your own instrument that then makes that music and so that for sure was a, a whole through line through a lot of the work that I've done. 
the creative flow that you get into when you're improvising, is it similar to the experience when you're making or is that very different for you? Um, I think it's quite different. Yeah. Yeah. Because the, 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 the playing and the improvising, you're very much there in the moment. Uh, and it's, so it's, it's, it's much more condensed. Um, and with, with the, the making and because even making has got different aspects. So the designing of an instrument is different from the process of once you've designed an instrument and you're actually just going through the process of following a design that you've already come up with. Uh, so the designing of an instrument is something that sometimes happens over a period of many, many months or even years. And um, so that that's quite a big you know, big point of difference because when you're actually creating mm -hmm. and improvising, it's right there in that moment, and you, you're just thinking about that that moment and where you are and and the people that you're working with. If you're also working with somebody, yeah. But I, I mean, you know, you're still there's a process, so you're hammering down the polypipe for your duduk read. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean in terms of, or, or are you sort of going off into planning mode when you're doing that? Uh, no, I think you're pretty much sort of hundred percent there with, the, with when you're making um, an instrument. You've got to, you know, you you fo you focused on that. I guess there, you know, of course we all go off into those other levels and uh, of of thought and and thinking different things. And it's to do with um, how uh, how much one does one particular thing. If you're making instrument after instrument, then sure, you, it's you, you just. It's a, it becomes more of a process. Uh, but say, for example, when you're working on the the concept of the duduk read for the first time, I think you're, you're totally in there. So it's a, like what you're saying, it's an, mm. a little bit similar to that improvisatory process, I guess. Yeah. So you have toured a lot in your life and certainly coming from Australia, going to different continents, it, it takes a toll. Like, do you have strategies for staying healthy mentally and physically when you're touring being away from home a lot um i i do i do generally keep pretty healthy i think i sort of look after you know care for what i eat and drink and exercise and and so on but it it's that's sort of changed a lot for a different reason um uh in that i'm not traveling much now not just because I sort of beat COVID to it in a way in 2018. Um, yeah, dur during 2018, I decided uh, that I would stop. Yeah, 2019, beginning of 2019, I I'd realised that 30% of my carbon footprint was my, what was virtually an annual trip to Europe. Um, performing yeah. and 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 I just thought no I can't can't keep doing this not not in the current um, condition yeah. that the planet's in that I just I couldn't live with that and so I made a decision at the beginning of 2019 not to do any more long haul flights um, mm -hmm. I sort of I didn't limit myself within Australia I thought oh well I'll still travel within Australia or uh, and um, but even yeah over the last three years that that hasn't happened obviously um so i made that quite firm decision and although it was a difficult decision i felt really good about that decision i think it was it was the right mm. decision for me to make and it meant that i you know meant that i wasn't going to be able seeing a lot of the friends that i'd made in europe and um and and also it was like a real shot in the arm to going and just traveling to different festivals and performing and meeting other musicians. Um, but I'm actually really glad that I made that decision rather than it having been imposed on me by COVID. I think it was in a way a lot easier for me because I'd already made that decision and it was a conscious choice, a, a positive conscious choice of mine. Um, yeah. So yeah, so, so nowadays I'm, I'm actually not you know, on the road nearly so much and not, and, and not touring, but I, I'd, I'd always find that I just loved that, that touring, touring process. It was just a, um, you know, e just as much and even more than the performing. It was also just the people that I would meet and the things that mm -hmm. I would learn on that journey. Yeah. Mm. But with the magic of the internet now, I mean, it's a, 
it's it astonishes me every time we're able to do things like this. Yeah, that's right. That yeah. you're yeah. To, you're tomorrow in this completely other side of the world. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Well, do you have any um, words of wisdom before we close out for younger musicians who are, are scared to take a chance? Like you've ta- you've been so adventurous in your life. Um, yeah, I, well, I don't. F- it's funny because I don't feel like I've been adventurous really because I've just. Um, so I guess that would be the. You know, I don't think they're words of wisdom. I think it's just. Um, I'd say you know do do what you you know, you believe in. You know, it's, I I think I have been lucky that I've been able to make a life and a living from what I love doing. And and I often do tell kids that, you know, if I'm, because I, I, over the years I've performed, done a lot of um, kids' performances and, and get to talk to kids a lot after, after the show. And they say, oh, how, how do you do that? How did you get to meet a musician? You know, how did you get to do, you know, because they could sort of see what fun I'm having. And I said, well, the thing is, you know, if at all possible, if you can work out a way to, to live a life doing what you love doing. That's probably one of the best things that you can do. Um, And that's, I luckily um, haven't, yeah, I don't feel like I've taken these sort of huge risks, but one of the things that I've done, I've never worried too much about what's going to happen next. I've just followed really my passion and what I I love to do. And um, I've said yes to opportunity when it comes and often you don't even realize that it's an op- opportunity it's that you know the combi breaking down on the coast of Yugoslavia rather than sort of getting all depressed about it you go okay well what what's next what do we do and just realizing that um well, you don't even realize it at the time it's years later you go wow that was the best thing that could have happened um you know and just rolling rolling with the punches really you just sort of um you know take take everything as a, a new and wonderful adventure Wonderful. Well, thanks so much for sharing your music and your stories today. My pleasure. Thanks, Leah. My life is so enriched by getting to know these incredibly inspiring creative guests and their perspectives on their lives and music. Please follow this podcast and sign up for my podcast newsletter to get sneak peeks for upcoming guests and find out about newly published transcripts.